Hello, I'm Peter Bogdanovich, and we're going to be looking at Daisy Miller together. So I'll be talking about my memories of making it 30 years ago. The director's company, we made three films, uh, Paper Moon and Francis Coppola's The Conversation, and this one, this was the last director's company film. The, uh, the director's company was Francis Coppola, Billy Friedkin, and me uh, for Paramount, and it was a great deal. This is actually the Trois Couronne Hotel in Vevey, Switzerland, and uh, which is the hotel that Henry James stayed in uh, when he wrote this story, and um, in, and it was published in 1879. And most of the dialogue is really from James's story, and that is in fact. The Trois Couronne, there are the three crowns, which is what it means, three crowns. And all these shots were taken of the hotel, different floors of the hotel. You're supposed to hear people sort of waking up and the place coming alive. Each shot is supposed to bring you closer to dawn and uh, everybody waking up. At first I asked Orson Welles if he would direct Sybil and me in this movie for the director's company, and uh, he declined and suggested that I direct it with Sybil. And I said to him, how would you begin? He said, with the little kid. So uh, since I remember having been in uh, Europe a few times, that they put the shoes out in front, I thought it'd be a funny way to show a mischievous kid by having him mix up the shoes. And uh, that's James McMurtry, Larry, the novelist Larry McMurtry's son. And he's now a very fine songwriter, singer. And he had this kind of surly temperament. And he uh, was very good in the picture. He was, in fact, it, ironically or prophetically, uh, named James McMurtry after, believe it or not, Henry James, who was one of Larry's favorite writers. That's all the Trois Couronne. It's a beautiful hotel, right? Nestled at the bottom of the hills there. All the music you hear in this is uh, was recorded for the picture, but it's all classical themes or songs of the period. Uh, it's supposed to be, we never tell you, but it's supposed to be 1876. And this is, as I said, in Vevey, Switzerland. There it is, the Hotel de Trois, Trois Couronne. Um, and this is, we didn't change anything. I think we just, uh, people are in costumes, of course, but we didn't really change much. This is how it looks. Up the hill from where we were lived Charlie Chaplin and Noel Coward. There are the Alps. You can hardly see them, but they're there. They're really beautiful. And we had to wait and wait and wait to uh, be able to see them because there was so much fog in, uh, in, and I think we were there in October. This is paying off the joke with the uh, shoes. <laughs> James's reaction. There you can see the Alps in the background in this. All the costumes were created by John Furness, English designer, and they were nominated for an Academy Award, which we didn't win. And that's Barry Brown. It begins with the kid, uh, as Orson suggests. Now, there's Barry reading the obituaries, which, in fact, he did read the obituaries. <laughs> we had him. We had James poke the woman's dress. Bad little boy. All the dialogue in this is uh, is actually from um, from the James story, long short story really. All this dialogue is from um, James, and you're supposed to be able to see the Alps back there, but of course it was that mist was constantly there. We had such trouble with this. Um, James actually wrote two uh, versions of this story. One was published in 1879. The other one. He rewrote it quite a bit for the New York, what's called the New York edition of all his stuff, which was about 1904. And this is all one long piece of film here where they talk. 
Just one cut to an insert, and then we come back. Barry Brown, who plays Winterbourne, is, it's very difficult to find an American actor who uh, has a kind of Europeanized quality. It's the quality of somebody who read a book. American actors don't generally seem that way. And Barry was a very good actor, although a very sad person. But he was superb in the movie, playing Winterbourne. He's very much like the character, and sad to say he later killed himself. This is Daisy's introduction, Sybil Shepherd. And this is the second movie we made together after the last picture show. There are the Alps. Sybil liked this part and wanted to play it, and we were looking for something to do together. And uh, so, of course, uh, this turned out to be what we did. We, we had another choice, which might have been better, but this is what we did. We were thinking of doing a Calder Willingham story called Rambling Rose, which was done later on with Laura Dern. Now, this shot here is very, very long take. We rehearsed it and rehearsed it, and it goes on for, I don't know, about 15 pages. It began with the boy running over, and now it continues and continues and continues. Oh, I suppose it's going over. Going to where? Why, right down to Italy. I don't know. I don't want to go to Italy. <laughs> I want to go to America. We had a lot of trouble with shooting this, of course, because I wanted to do it in one long piece. And um, we had nothing but overcast for days and days. So what we did was we stopped shooting and we rehearsed. We rehearsed this shot, which really does run for about 15 pages. Uh, Barry stepped on her dress and she looked. We did this uh, many, many times, but we rehearsed it for about a week because it's all, it's about two or three shots, I think is all we did, on, on, pointing toward the uh, mountains. And uh, after waiting, we finally cleared enough that we could at least see the Alps in some angles. We started to shoot and we shot everything, all this, and another sh shot that finishes the sequence. Uh, about 20 pages in, in one day. Very difficult for everybody, particularly for Sybil, of course, because she had so much dialogue. All this dialogue was chattering on and on was exactly as it was, was in the book. Now there's a shimmering on the water, as you'll notice in the background, because everything we shot in uh, Switzerland, for this opening sequence, which is almost half the movie, um, was shot with a black silk stocking over the lens. Alberto Spagnoli, the camera, the director of photography, the wonderful Italian cameraman, who um, unfortunately died very young, uh, was superb. And we looked for an idea, some idea to uh, make this whole sequence look very different from um, the Roman sequence that follows. So it was an old trick in uh, silent pictures and in early talkies to put a silk stocking over the lens. That's what we did here. So all of that creates it's what helps to create that shimmer in the in the uh, in the water. He tries to be funny and he can't be funny. He doesn't make her laugh at all. She just chatters right on. Now the fact of the matter is she's talking the way a girl would have talked at this time in the United States. But in New York. But and this, this is the end of the shot right here is coming up. And she looks at him. And one shot of him and then we cut to her and then this goes on for for another several minutes without a, several pages without a cut. So I think we did the whole thing in three shots. Well, I thought Sybil and I should do this together. Of course if we had they would have killed us more than they did. <laughs> but uh, there was talk of I thought of playing the part and having Orson direct it. I felt a little bit like Winterbourne in the sense that I'm... My parents are European and I was born, conceived in Europe and born in New York just after my parents arrived. I grew up with a European household, so I felt a bit Europeanized in America and a bit Americanized in Europe. And there's the cut. And this is... Um, George Morfogan playing Eugenio, one of my oldest, oldest friends. I've known him since I was 18. 
we worked together at New York Shakespeare Festival. Uh, Joe Papp in the park, in Central Park, with Joe Papp. Um, 1957, I think we met. Well, I was wrong. It wasn't all in one shot, one and two shots. There's a few cuts here. But it wasn't too many. Um, and there was 20 pages, those two shots. The whole idea was that the Americans were very un-European and very kind of vulgar by contrast. This idea to put this scene in a kind of Turkish bath was uh, Freddie Raphael's idea, Frederick Raphael, who gets credit for the screenplay. But this set was built on a soundstage by Fernando Scafiotti, the brilliant Italian designer who did a lot of uh, Bertolucci's films, worked with Visconti. He died young too, unfortunately. It's rather funny. It's what they used to do. They're playing chess in the back and people are reading. This is what they did. I thought it was a rather funny idea that people taking a bath. Mildred Natwood's one of my favorite people. She was the only actress I ever cast in a picture without meeting. I called an agent in, in New York and he said, well, what about Mildred Natwick for the aunt? And I said, perfect, she's got it. Let's cast her. And I, of course, knew her work from films she'd done with John Ford and, uh, and others. Uh, and it just uh, was, and she, I loved her and we became good friends. Wonderful actress. Scafiotti built this set. It's a very good set. He was very annoyed with me because way up above their heads, you really can't possibly see it, was a little window. He said, I hope you can show the window. I said, well, look at it. It's way up. I mean, how can I show the, win the window? It was several feet above their heads. He was rather annoyed that I never showed the window. But I said, the only way I can do that is to get under the water and shoot up. He just didn't, didn't, didn't get that. Scafiotti worked on a number of American films after this. We shot the whole picture with an Italian crew, and we brought them from Rome for this. Scafiotti did a wonderful job in the picture, but most of the sets, we've hardly built anything. This was one of the few things we built. Almost everything was, uh, was done in real locations. This whole conversation, of course, is about you know, whether she's that you had better not meddle what what ancient now she tells you right here what the problem is you better not meddle with the little american girls you've lived too long out of the country you're bound to make a great mistake which is of course which is uh, i'm not too innocent and then she says too guilty then now we go to big close-ups here for the first time because that in fact is exactly what the movie's about and uh he has to think about it, and there's a long dissolve. And of course, he doesn't get it, unfortunately, for him and for Daisy. But he is the one who's guilty, and he assumes that she is. I wrote a line, and they all laughed. It sort of sums that up. You know, some people figure whatever they're doing, somebody else must be doing it too. So he's judging her by his own lack of innocence, his own guilt. Of course, he falls madly in love with her. This was uh, done. We only had a very short time of the night to uh, shoot this, this angle here, where you can see the uh, mountains again. We had to shoot it at just the right time when it was what's known as dusk or the, the witching hour or twilight. Of course, it only lasts about 20 minutes. So we had to rehearse like crazy. Uh, to to try to get this within the 20 minutes, because this, again, is a very long, long, long take. It starts with her, uh, starts when he walked into it and goes down this here. Now they turn and they go back for a long time. It doesn't look difficult, but it is. Uh, you see the mountains? You couldn't see them in about 20 minutes from now. You couldn't see them. So I think we did all this in f with the first or second take. I just felt, uh, why did we shoot these in these long takes? It just seemed natural for this not to do a lot of cutting, but to let it feel... Uh, this was difficult to time this so that she would be in exactly that place. 
in order to say that. She doesn't know anyone. Uh, the camera crew was awfully good, all Italian. And now we introduce Cloris Leachman for the film. There's her mother, doesn't know what to do. <laughs> Cloris had won an Academy Award uh, on the last picture show two years before we did this. This was the first time we worked together again. It's all about different sets of mores, this movie. The fact that Sybil talks quickly and very American, because she's in these beautiful clothes, it was assumed by some people, uh, some critics and some audience, that she wasn't being anachronistic. But that was, in fact, not true. The truth is that she was being the way a girl would have been. If you took her and put her in a Western of this period, which is 1876, in America was the days of the bad men. The, uh, in Tombstone, the gunfight at the OK Corral. If you'd put her there, of course, nobody would have a problem. It's just putting her in Europe, people saw, well, she's being Sybil. Well, of course, she was, was being Daisy Miller. She was, as Orson Welles said, who, when I asked him about this, he said, well, Sybil, of course, was born to play, born to play this part, because it's very much like Sybil was, flirtatious and playful and a little shocking at times. It was very much like Sybil, which is why she liked the part. Uh, yeah. And again, it's a long take. She walks out of it, and then they talk. They talked at the at the banister there for a while, and uh, it's been no cut. And now we find out that Daisy's mother is very much like Daisy, talks her head off. We had one absolutely great screening of this picture at Harvard for a bunch of undergraduate, undergraduates, about 300, who absolutely got everything, mainly because they had read the story we did the whole story, 90 pages, 90 minutes. And all this stuff, we, I don't think we shot this all in one night. I think we shot it over a period of two or three different nights because we only could shoot during this one moment at twilight when you could see the mountains. Otherwise, what was the point of being there? Now, she's saying I, I would think she'd rather go inside because she's trying to be formal. But, of course, in America, they don't do such things. But Cloris's character is trying to be correct. And, and Henry James went to Harvard, and maybe that's another reason why it went down so well. <laughs> All this dialogue, which sounds quite modern at times, is actually right from the uh, James story, either from the 1876 version or the, uh, the 1879 version or the 1904 version. Lines like, isn't it cool, and things like that. Surprising is uh, exactly... Uh, what he wrote. Like Dickens and a lot of 19th century novelists, uh, the choice of names for people were often significant. Winterborn, born in winter, meaning winter is the death of the year. He's the death of Daisy. Daisy, a spring flower, white, innocent. Those were not chosen uh, randomly. This uh, moment with James, uh, we put in. Bang. Again, it's a way of forecasting the future. This was a tourist boat. Those looks of Sybil, she was great at that kind of moment. Uh, those direct looks. And this was a real... Uh, steamer that we used uh, that was this tourist boat on the lake. We had to shoot it carefully to avoid any freeways or anachronisms. The biggest one was this one. This is the Chateau de Chillon, and it's the only angle, this angle, where you couldn't see that there were three freeways around it. So we had to go out in the boat and get exactly the right position to to uh, see it without freeways. The basic idea of Daisy Miller traveling from hotel to hotel in Europe, American girl with her mother, is a story that uh, James had heard and uh, then dramatized it from there. He sort of spun off on that basic premise. These moments here... Come on, let's be the first ones off. ...are, of course, the... The close-ups are supposed to tell you 
what is really happening. Those moments were silent moments are supposed to tell you what's really happening. That's the filmmaking part, or the the the, the um, that's the cinematic part. One is supposed to pay attention to the close-ups. That's why we don't use many of them. This was stretching it a bit to have this guy playing the harmonica, but I thought we could get away with it. He looks sort of like a poet. And this music he's playing is uh, when you and I were young, Maggie played sort of in a lower key, in a in a sort of slightly minor key. It was a popular song of that period. Lavagnino, an Italian uh, composer, uh, scored it for us uh, on the harmonica, adapting when you and I were young, Maggie. And we used it at the end, for the end credits, too. Uh, this is, in fact, the famous uh, Chateau de Chillon, which is a big tourist attraction near the day. Byron was um, kept uh, in prison. We're going to see that in a moment. And this was all shot, really, there. And we uh, put in all these, this dialogue was not from the the uh, not from the story we we had to put in some stuff uh kind of kept it going of course all these rooms everything here is was is there you can go to the chateau de chillon and and, uh, and see it well it wasn't difficult to secure the location they actually uh just had to pay them some money this is an oubliette he talks about it they used to throw people down there it's really quite beautiful and again, all this was shot with the with this uh, black silk stocking over the lens. The book uh, Daisy Miller uh, was uh, quite controversial when it came out. It was, in fact, they had a hard time finding an American publisher because it was thought to be an insult to American girlhood. I think that was one of the reviews because she's so forward and it's sort of written as though she's vulgar. Of course, James is on her side, really. So it was first published in England, uh, and um, became quite popular there. And it was a big success, actually, when it was finally published in America. This whole sequence was sort of made up as we on the locations to suit the locations. This beautiful uh, chapel, uh, this extraordinary ceiling, how could we not show it? Um, Uh, it is there, everything is, it's all, all real. Of course, this was shot in 1973, in the winter, and uh, released in 74. Um, here's the um, prison where uh, Byron was kept. On that uh, pillar there, you can see, we get closer to it shortly, uh, it's his name, he scratched his name, Lord Byron, into the pillar, and. Uh, they put a frame around it. You see it actually in the next shot better. I tell he tells you all about it. It's really true, everything. And um, this is where it happened. And the quote is from a Byron's poem. There it is. You can see it on the right, Byron. We shot this, uh, as I said, 30 years ago, long before the Vogue for Henry James came about and for period pictures set in this period that Merchant Ivory did and uh, a number of other people have done. Jane Austen, Henry James, Edith Wharton. Nobody done any of this kind of picture really since MGM in the 30s, but um, costume pictures like this, but uh, it was a challenge. I remember watching the dailies and thinking, I don't know who's gonna wanna see this because nobody had made a picture like this at that time. Camera closed in on her there because she's actually really annoyed because she's now fallen in love with him. He doesn't get it yet. He never does get it, really. That's the story. It's about, This movie could have been called The Man Who Didn't Get It. So we were somewhat criticized at the time, uh, although it got great reviews in some places, and particularly the New York Times, Newsweek. New York Times chose it for their book of the thousand best films ever made. Uh, Vincent Camby, who reviewed it, was a big fan of this book, and as is Gore Vidal and Leon Edel, who uh, the prominent Henry James scholar wrote the six-volume 
biography of James, they both all were very complimentary about it because they felt we'd captured the, the story. Uh, we certainly tried to capture it. We did every single page. Nothing's left out. She says it right there, I want you to come just for me. He laughs, he doesn't get it. He just doesn't get it. Shall we go back? <laughs> that was very much like Sybil. I don't want to take the boat now. The way she said that. She was very bright, and cheerful, and light, and gay, Sybil. Still is. This stuff of him walking away and talking to himself. That's, uh, we do a series of those kind of little jokes with the servants and the people in this, which is, um, I must say, inspired by Lubitsch. This was another angle which we could, from which we could not see the um, freeways that surrounded the castle. He doesn't know why she's unhappy. They don't take the boat because she's not happy anymore, because he doesn't get it. And this is the last time we see the chateau, though she mentions it significantly toward the end of the picture, it's mentioned again. And there's a long pause before we come in to make a definite break. And there's Rome, that's really Rome. This was not shot with the silk stocking and nothing shimmers anymore. The Switzerland sequence, the Vevey sequence, was all shot after the Roman sequence. This painter doing her portrait, which turns out, as you'll see, to be a miniature, it was a good idea. We shot the Roman sequence first, um, probably because of weather considerations, um, and because we were we were based in Rome and the whole crew was Rome, Roman. And so we finished everything in Rome and then we moved to Switzerland and finished the picture there. So it was done in reverse. The aunt's uh, sitting room um, um, was a real location because you just saw out to Rome. So it was a, a real, real place. It was somewhat considerably redressed by Scarfiotti. I remember him running in and moving the pillows just before we shot this. <laughs> he wanted to have the certain pillows showing. He was really stickler for detail, which of course is the most important thing in movies, is the details. Maybe it's the most important thing in everything. And uh, there's some long takes here. Millie Notwick is brilliant. She, he crossed the other side and we played it on the other side now. And a lot of this was described by James and then we kind of put it into dialogue. Some of it's actual dialogue, but some of it was the business about the brothers and his cousins and all that stuff was uh, described. Who's the portrait for? Uh, her son, that business, we, we took that from a paragraph in James. And this is the topper that Freddie wrote, that it's a miniature. Eileen Brennan and I, that's Eileen Brennan and I, had worked together uh, on the last picture show. And then she was in a few other pictures after that, before we did this. I think she did The Sting. I know we did quite a few long takes in this sequence. This business about have you seen Olga? We, um, that was added dialogue to um, give us the information that Winterbourne had had an affair with a foreign woman, which was written actually uh, as a paragraph in James. We had to dialogue it out. That was a complicated shot to move around and see Daisy enter in the mirror. And everything sharp, as you see, which is again very difficult, and I don't know how Alberto Spagnoli, the cameraman, did it. I said, everything sharp, everything sharp, see, si, see, si, everything sharp. And then when I asked him how he did it, he said, I don't know. <laughs> now that shot that began in a close-up of Daisy, um, this goes on for about 30 pages. It's just endless. And there were all these mirrors. This was a real room with a lot of mirrors. It's not a set. We redressed it a little bit, but it's basically is uh, a real house uh, in, uh, in uh, Rome, and uh, very, this is probably one of the most, probably the most complicated shot in the picture, which begins in the close-up of Daisy, and I think ends in a close-up of Eileen Brennan, and it's, it goes on for pages and pages. We did it 35 times, 
uh, I think in two days before we got it right. Very, very difficult because you have five actors and numerous mirrors. You see, we always wanted to see Daisy in, in the mirror. If we couldn't see her in, in, real, in, in front of the camera, we wanted to see her in the mirror and we wanted her sharp. So it had to be shot with a wide angle lens in order to help us with the sharpness. And there was an enormous amount of light that had to be added. And it was very warm, as you can see. Chorus keeps dabbing her face because it was really hot. The women could hardly breathe because they had to wear these corsets, which is the way women dressed in those days, with these corsets that actually displaced the heart. So with five actors and mirrors on every wall and I don't know how many camera moves, uh, this was quite an ambitious shot. But I felt somehow that this wasn't the kind of thing I wanted to do in, with cutting. I like to just watch it, let you make up your own mind, let the audience make up their own mind what they think. Uh, Verna Fields, the editor of the, of the picture, who worked with me on What's Up Doc uh, and Paper Moon, actually, I had a running joke with her, uh, which was uh, because she'd had an operation, a cancer operation, and it was pretty sick but she was recovering and uh, I wanted to do the picture so I said listen I want this to be easy for you so we're not gonna you're not gonna have to cut very much and she kept saying well you I don't have anything to do in this picture it's just all these long takes and I said well I don't want to exert you too much you had an operation that was a running joke between us and there really wasn't much to cut uh, which isn't exactly true now here's where you see all of them and it hasn't hasn't cut yet from the close-up. It was very hard for the actors, of course, to do this. They enjoyed it because, of course, it's, it's like when the curtain goes up. Good actors like this because when the curtain goes up on, the, on a play, you know, uh, there's no cutting, it's, that's it. But uh, I think it was pretty frustrating, too, because in, in James McMurtry, he'd never even acted before, so it wasn't easy and very difficult for the camera operator to sustain all this. And the, you see all these small camera moves had to be very precise. And uh, there was some overlapping dialogue. All this was carefully rehearsed. We did it over and over. Get it right. And uh, <laughs> I remember as it would come down closer to the end of it, everybody, of course, got more and more nervous, hoping that they, did, they didn't screw it up, because if they did, we'd have to go back to the beginning again. But the, nobody complained. Uh, and here's how it ends, I think, in a close-up of... Eileen, and that was it. I think it was about 20 pages. We had to get special permission, of course, to shoot this shot in Rome to clear the street for just a few seconds. A few, not really more than a few minutes, really, where we, there were no cars. And, because um, that was the Piazza del Popolo up at the top of the hill. It's a very populated street. Now this is the Pincio, what's known as the Pincio, it overlooks Rome, which you see at the end of the shot. Again, this is a long take, they walk through, this is a beautiful park overlooking Rome. And a uh, famous place for strolling. And she's not supposed to be strolling by herself. You see, this is all, of course, before the emancipation of women. It's all before women could vote, it's all before any of that. So uh, there were much stricter rules in a funny way in Europe than there were in America, even though America was more Puritan. Uh, but being a young country, it was more free in a certain way. Complicated the dynamics of the two places. Europe being old fashioned and, Amer and uh, America being sort of new fashioned and yet also Puritan. We had a, quite a few extras for this scene. There's not much dancing. <laughs> she goes right on talking. And there's the fountain. It's all real. That was all, it's all one shot. And there at the end, you see Rome in the distance. Now, this um, Punch and Judy, which uh, Sybil and I actually saw in Rome on the Pincio, uh, we asked them to do it in the picture. This is typical of uh, uh, Italian humor and. Um, the fact that death appears and uh, 
ends the thing, of course, is a bit of a prophetic uh, forecasting of the story. We had a lot of trouble with this shot because Barry had a twitch in his eye and he couldn't keep it still. And this is a wonderful. She looks right in the lens right there. And uh, he's not looking there, he's looking next to it. It's a trick that I learned from Hitchcock that if you want to get a very direct moment, you can have uh, an actor look right in the lens as, as though it's the other act, the other character's point of view. This is a moment where there's a loose woman you see by herself, and that's what they think Daisy is. Um, and now here comes death. Uh, that was, Sybil watched this and she thought it was very funny. She was really laughing. They did it for her off camera. And uh, she was delighted by this and was laughing like that. Um, and the guy who did this was wonderful. Gives you a great sense of the humor of, uh, of the time. He didn't want to give her that much money, give him that much money. <laughs> Sybil and I worked together just about the same way we did on picture shows. You know, we, I'd help her with it. Um, but of course, it was, I just helped her to be herself because she was very much the character. She understood it. Did you ever see anything so cool, she said. Did you ever see anything so cool? That is absolutely a line from James. I couldn't believe it. Did you ever see anything so cool? You'd think cool, we thought cool was a phrase from the 60s, and there it was in 1870. And here's where the crux of the story is. I never allowed a gentleman to do anything. She did. She's definitely an early suffragette in disguise. Uh, and he's jealous and doesn't even know why he's jealous. Because he doesn't, he doesn't get it on any level. Giovanelli, played by um, Duilio Del Prete, an Italian actor that I found in Rome. A wonderful actor. He died young, misdiagnosed. Now, this dialogue here was indicated in a paragraph in um, in James, but we had to dialogue it out, so I wrote this dialogue. Every picture I made up through Daisy Miller, Targets, Last Picture Show, What's Up Doc, Paper Moon and Daisy Miller, all of those films were released and um, finished uh, exactly as I wanted them to be, for good or bad, that's what we wanted to make. Now, of course, this leads us into this big scene with Mrs. Walker, uh, which is from directly from the book. And uh, again, it's this whole thing about what people are allowed to do or not allowed to do, this whole idea of what's proper and what isn't proper, and the assumption of innocence, the, I mean, the, the, the assumption of guilt, the assumption of her being a loose woman just because she's walking on the street with... Uh, two men. Of course, we tried to get across the fact that she's jealous because she's attracted to Winterbourne and would like uh, to get him in bed herself. <clears throat> it's one of the reasons I asked Eileen to play this, because she has a kind of a sexual quality, it's, uh, which being suppressed in this I thought would work. Eileen, in fact, is quite bawdy and funny in life. I think what interested me about this material was that it was so different from anything I'd done. I love period pictures and uh, period stories, anyway. And uh, I thought it would be interesting. I thought, I think what touched me about this particular story was the misunderstanding about the, the girl. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems in our society still is that men and women don't understand each other. Uh, the battle of the sexes or the misunderstandings between the sexes Gracious me. is uh, sort of at the heart of most of the problems in society, it seems to me. And here's a kind of a, this is sort of spelled out for you here. Uh, that look on Sybil's face, very touching, I think. She wanted him to stand up for her, and he didn't stand up for her. That was what we were trying to show there. So he's, he's torn here, and again makes the wrong decision. He should have gone with Daisy. 
he should have not stayed with Mrs. Walker. But again, he makes the mistake. And uh, I guess that's what interested me about this material is these misunders, these little miss. And now she looks back, you see, the look that he doesn't see. Um, he doesn't get it. And it's the little things, the little mistakes in life that uh, often can lead to tragedy. Um, as I unfortunately found out in my life some years later, tragic mistakes are made with little inconsistencies or little little mistakes that uh, that don't seem very important at the time. And then later when you review uh, what happened, you realize that if only he'd done this, if only he'd done that, if only he'd done this, maybe she wouldn't have died. And uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's what the story's about. Mistaken moments, lost moments, overlooked opportunities, misapprehensions, all little things that add up to a big one. This was a difficult shot. Maybe we've lived too long in Europe, he says. He finally, he lightheartedly gets it, but doesn't hold on to it. And this, this, these looks between them are very, uh, very filled with sexual tension, at least on her part. She's, she's very jealous. It's all underneath the surface. And James doesn't underline it at all, so we needed to underline it in the close-ups. That was the meaning of the close-ups here. That's what they're for. That's why another reason I avoided them in other places and did long takes was so that when we needed a close-up to mean something, it would. It's kind of a, a preview moment when they go uh, behind the, uh, the parasol. What is happening behind the parasol? Of course, he assumes the worst. That's why we go to a close-up. And um, he's, he's horrified. Of course, probably nothing's happening behind the parasol. What we really made here was a kind of a, an art film uh, at a time when people weren't making them at all. There is a little bit of uh, Eine kleine Nachtmusik from my mother's favorite composer, Mozart. Um, now this sequence was all supposed to be by candlelight. And again, we, uh, there's that room with all the mirrors again. And this was another very difficult uh, sequence to shoot. It was very hot because of the focus. Very good actor, Nicholas Jones, English actor that we brought in from London. And uh, he's a friend of, uh, plays a friend of Winterbourne's, and he's rather ambiguous. Well, I told him there was no just use horrible, Charles. She's dinner. trying to take revenge. That was difficult to do, them both talking at the same time, had to have two mics. And uh, we didn't post sync it. It was all, had to be done rather, rather carefully. Um, there's a joke here, again, a kind of a Lubitschian little joke as we pan over to the uh, other musician who's kind of annoyed <laughs> at the soloist. A uh, little, little cheap gag. Uh, now there's a mirror shot. Very hard to keep the focus. And uh, you see Winterbourne in the mirror behind her. I'm sorry. Of course, she's jealous. That's what it's all about, really. And we go to the mirror, and there he is. Tricky shots. Now, that's Duilio singing. He actually did sing. And Giovanelli is singing an aria from Verdi's Rigoletto, um, which then uh, we see later in an opera sequence. Uh, Duilio del Prete uh, did, was a singer and did sing this himself, this opera. We brought him over for the musical that I did after this, which was what Sibyl and I referred to as the debacle. I wrote it while we were shooting this at Long Last Love, which we called it a Long Last Turkey. One could have called it a Long Last Lousy, as though he'd been waiting for us to have a lousy picture. <laughs> oh, well. This movie that we're watching is about jealousy, envy, 
manners, bad manners, misapprehensions, distrust, guilt, innocence. And Sybil and I got quite a bit of that kind of stuff because we were a rather public couple uh, living together in sin. We weren't married. And in those days, living together without being married was not really uh, accepted as much as it obviously is now. I'm surprised to say that, but it's true even in the 70s. And that's, so this movie was seen, unfortunately, by a lot of people through the prism of that relationship as opposed to for what it was, which was uh, an attempt to do a very faithful adaptation of a famous story by a great American writer, a story about misunderstandings between men and women. Cary Grant called me and said, for God's sake, Peter, stop telling people you're in love. And stop telling me you're happy. Why? Because they're not happy and they're not in love. Just remember, Peter, people do not like beautiful people. And well, we felt the sting of that, I'm afraid. And I think this picture was hurt in the public's perception because of that. Now, there's a cut. You see, we, the cut wouldn't have made as big an impact as it did just then, or as supposed to have done just then. If uh, if it had been cross -cut, a lot of cross-cutting, that was why we played a lot of scenes with no cut. That little joke when she interrupts the song before she thinks it's finished was something we put in. I do have a tendency to try to put in a joke as often as I can. Uh, it was everything I could do to resist having somebody fall into the rum and baths. I'm afraid I'm hopelessly addicted to slapstick. He's a little bored, the musician. I say we'll get a little shtick here and there. <laughs> Hard to keep it out. Each section of this sequence begins with musicians. And uh, here's a guy sleeping, he's sleeping it off. An old uh, Italian actor that we, we used. It was a gorgeous room where we shot this. And there's now you see Winterborn, and in the mirror you see them. To keep them even that much in focus was very difficult, uh, very difficult for uh, the cameraman and difficult for the actors, of course, because it was very hot. Of course, it was hot in Rome. There was no air conditioning in those days, of course, so they, they must have boiled. It's all a story about what's going on underneath the surface is really what it's about. And that means that uh, a lot of it is unspoken as in uh, this moment coming up, where she snubs her, just turns her back on her. And Daisy gets it right then, again, in a silent moment. And this is one of the biggest close-ups in the picture. Jealousy, night and day you torture me. Again, we try to show the working class. Here's the guy, poor concierge, is trying to have a bite to eat and gets interrupted. We tried to show the working class being more real and, you know, yawning, and tired, and eating, and sort of more real than the upper-middle-class snobs. Here's the bellman. They can't help but show how they feel. This was shot in a real church overlooking the Campidoglio, which you see, you'll see when we go outside here. This is the actual church. I can't remember the name of it, but it overlooks the Campidoglio, which was designed by Michelangelo. And... Uh, this is beautifully described by James. We tried to, to uh, capture it, uh, this moment when he sees her in the sunlight. Uh, it's, uh, I believe it's a description in, in, in James. It's a kind of a defining moment for, uh, for Winterbourne, who's obviously crazy about her and doesn't even realize how crazy about her he is. He doesn't admit to his own feelings. This dialogue is wonderfully played here, all by Henry James, wonderfully played by uh, Mildred Natwick. It was interesting how good the dialogue is by James, particularly considering the fact that he always wanted to be a playwright, and wrote a couple of plays. In fact, he wrote a version of Daisy Miller, which was on the stage, in which Daisy doesn't die. But he never had a success as a playwright, uh, though it was something he desperately wanted. 
That's interesting, since his dialogue really is very good. Now here comes the moment where uh, it's kind of meant to resonate. And uh, Mildred Nat looks so brilliant in this way she plays this. I'm sure she's capable of thought at all. Certainly seen it at this moment here. We go to the close up to tell us that it's supposed to be a key moment. That's the problem with movies that use close ups all the time is you can't you can't make a point anymore because you you're in close up right from the beginning. That was the good thing about the classic technique of uh, filmmaking because close ups were uh, saved for important moments. Television, because of the small screen, sort of made the close-up very common, talking heads, and it sort of infected movies too, so that the close-up is no longer an effective device. Here's the Campidoglio, which you see, it's a famous tourist attraction in Rome. When she looks down, you see Daisy and Giovanelli walking. That was designed by Michelangelo. Wouldn't it be funny? If they didn't know the impression, if they were innocent and didn't know the impression, she said, no, it wouldn't be funny. And of course, again, he, he puts his finger on the story and goes right past it. Uh, this is, uh, again, a real hotel in, uh, in Rome. And uh, we're setting it up for later. He's very happy that she's there. This was all uh, described by James. Hey, the working class is real, you see. Oh, but they're not supposed to think that way. Put that in, none of that's in the book. Those little moments are, I'm afraid, directorial touches. Try to get a laugh in a story that didn't have many. Now, this sequence was described, I think, in two or three paragraphs by, uh, by James and had to be dialogued out, which uh, I did. And the whole idea that she's singing and he's playing the piano and all that was described, but it wasn't dramatized. Oh. Sybil had to learn to play Pop Goes the Weasel, which uh, Sybil doesn't know how to play the piano, but she actually learned it for this scene so that we could see her hands on the keys. And she learned it. She can do anything she wanted to do, this Sybil. She was amazing. So we show the keys so that we can see that she actually did learn to do it. Not that it's a hard song or anything, but if you don't play the piano, it's pretty difficult. And he's singing live and she's playing. And now she speeds it up, which is very Sybil. Of course, this is long before Moonlighting or uh, The Sybil Show made her uh, famous as a comedian. Uh, I thought she was funny then, but I was called a fool for love at the time. Anyway, one of the things I noticed about her in the last picture show was how funny she was, off camera as well as playing the comedy scenes and that. This song, I, when you and I were young, Maggie, of course, is uh, very poignant later when you think about it, but it shows him as a lovesick fool here. The song itself was very popular in 1876 or 1875. It was a song of the period where the daisies sprung and we uh, purposely had her sing it without the poignancy underneath it uh, because she's young and uh, isn't singing prophetically. And that was one of the decisions Sylvia and I made was that she would sing the whole song like it was not really what it's really about, which is lost youth. We didn't underline it. And you notice Cloris Leachman has a hard time holding, keeping her, catching her breath. It's because she's wearing that very tight corset. So you can imagine what the women of the period had to go through in order to keep that hourglass figure. Again, another constriction on women, uh, very much of its time. And it didn't start to loosen up, really, until women were given the vote. And that didn't happen until 1920, 50 years after this story takes place. Oh, she says she ain't. But only 80 years ago. She might as well be. I suppose there's a bit of 
Winterbourne in James, as there is a, quite a bit of James in Winterbourne, but I don't know much about, too much about James's personal life, but he never married. No! Randolph! That was a joke we put in of a um, sort of morbid sense of humor that this little boy had. This was shot outside Rome. It's a famous tourist attraction. It's part of the Roman gardens. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's a very well-known uh, ruin. It's part of the ruins outside Rome. As you maybe know, all the ruins in Rome from ancient times are protected and they're kept. And there's a pillar here and a little bit of a statue there and a broken wall here and there. And they're all kept as a reminder of uh, the Roman Empire when all roads led to Rome. I had been to Rome before we shot this. I'd been there in the late 60s working on a picture for Sergio Leone, which I never made, which he made, called Duck You Sucker or A Fistful of Dynamite, but I, I didn't. But I fell in love with Rome in the late 60s, and my uh, second daughter was conceived there. Your mother says she believes you're engaged. And then this was kind of, I think, the second or third time I'd been back. It was fun to shoot there. And as Again, that exchange of looks was significant. And here, uh, she tricks him again. She's flirting with him. She is engaged. And then she's flirting with him. And he, of course, takes it very seriously. Sybil had a lot of difficulty keeping her eyes wide open. I said, don't take your eyes off, which wasn't easy, because the light was very strong, and she has blue eyes that are very sensitive to light. And now she takes it back. So he just doesn't know what to make of things. He doesn't fig can't figure her out at all. What is she doing to him, is what he keeps thinking. This was lit on Roman Street. Again, you see parts of the, of the uh, ruins. This was, uh, again, a scene that was dialogued out by us. Uh, it's described in the, uh, in the book. I think there's a couple of lines of dialogue, but not many. I can't decide if she's really reckless or really... Well, no one can say you aren't gonna. Here he is again, trying to figure it out. Two very good actors. We didn't had no reason to cut. Maybe she's just and again, he gets right close to the truth. Maybe she's just an American girl, and that's that, which is what it is. It's a hopeless puzzle. And he thinks she's off with Giovanelli, and of course, she's just trying to get him to make a move himself. And he doesn't get it. This whole upcoming sequence, which was shot around the Colosseum, uh, it was very difficult to do because the Colosseum, for those of you who have been to Rome know, is surrounded on all sides by traffic, day and night. I mean, drivers in Rome are absolutely insane. It's the most difficult, the most looniest drivers you've ever seen. Everybody has their own rules. Nobody pays attention to anything. Of course, this is, these are famous uh, tourist attractions parts of Rome. Hitchcock once told me when you're going to shoot at a famous city, show things that are famous and that, that audiences will recognize. Well, of course, James knew what he was doing. He set this in the Colosseum. But the Colosseum, which is what you're looking at here, is, uh, as I say, there it is, surrounded by traffic. So we had to find angles where you didn't see traffic. And uh, that was a very wide-angle shot. We did that with an 11 lens. Everything here had to be, all the sound effects, all the dialogue, everything had to be added later because it was just nothing but traffic everywhere. And so what we did was shoot the Colosseum sequences at the Colosseum, put the sound in later, and the scenes where you see what's outside the Colosseum was shot, you know, about 20 miles away outside of Rome, and the two were combined. This is the Col the real Colosseum. We're not, nobody's allowed to shoot in the Colosseum any longer. We, uh, we got a special dispensation from the Pope at the time even to do it. I'm joking, but we, it was not easy to get permission. But I think because we were an American company, they wanted to, uh, they sort of stretched the rules and let us in to shoot in one section. In fact, in James's time, 
the Colosseum was surrounded by swamps, and that's why it was dangerous and suggested people didn't go there because there's a lot of mosquitoes and uh, a lot of illness. Malaria is what it was. They called it the Roman fever. And of course, her being there alone with the man at night, the implication is, as we just showed, two people making love, the implication is that she's, you know, absolutely a loose woman and all his suspicions now are confirmed because she's there of course she doesn't know the rules and as we find out later she wanted to go and Giovanelli you know always did what she wanted which we found out we find that out at the end so all this dialogue here had to be looped afterward in other words put in later the actors did a very good job of it because we couldn't use the original dialogue at all because it was so much traffic sound when was Mademoiselle ever prudent? I wouldn't want to go home without that. Prudente. Got some splendid pills. And of course, this, this is the last scene with Daisy because she does get the Roman fever. And, uh, the only color in the scene, really, is the, uh, the red rose, red being the color of death. I'm afraid it was fairly on, done on purpose. This line about the Colosseum well, I have seen the Colosseum by moonlight. That's one thing I can rave about. There ain't no Colosseum in Schenectady yet. There ain't no Colosseum in Schenectady yet was a line that Freddie Raphael wrote. Why are you always so stiff? Why are you so stiff? She's still trying to get a rise out of him, and he won't do it. Now, that shot of Daisy with the carriage was shot miles away from the Colosseum because of the, all the traffic, so that was a way of doing it. So his shot was done one location and her shots were done somewhere else that shot of course was done on the Appia Antica about 20 miles outside Rome but that is in fact what it looked like in its day and that's the last time you see Daisy I don't care if I have the Roman fever or not which was a difficult shot to make close up and then goes off into the distance not really sure where we shot that but it's not around the Colosseum now this is the uh, same aria that uh, Giovanelli was singing at the party, sort of mocks him. This, this is the real opera house in, uh, in Rome where we shot. This was a very tricky shot to do, showing the stage and then dolling around to see his face. And it, it was a lot of tricks involved to get, the, get it, including slightly pulling his chair backward to, at the same time as we were dolling so that we could get into the angle on him. This was not shot at the opera house. This was shot in a restaurant near the Pincio, actually, because um, the opera house didn't look right. <laughs> there was no angle that we could get this sort of moment, so we shot it somewhere else. We put that in, the whole opera thing, because the, the conversation between um, Winterbourne and uh, his friend that, we, that happens here uh, is indicated uh, in the story. And I think it says it's at the opera, but there was no, no particular scene at the opera. I haven't read that much of James. I've read a few other stories. I read Portrait of a Lady. A lot of his work resonates out of Daisy Miller. It's almost like a, a kind of rough sketch for a lot of his other novels. There are some writers that I'm more fond of than James. It's just sort of a coincidence that I was led to this story and became enamored of it. Now we shot this angle on him with a very wide angle lens to distort the face. There was a temptation to show Daisy sick uh, and uh, we thought about it but then we decided to be faithful to James. James doesn't show the sick room. He shows them waiting and uh, it seems like everybody, the boy, Eugenio, Eugenio looks at him with some disgust because he knows how she feels, felt about him, and he never got it. He seems to have rejected her, even though he thought she'd rejected him. The boy doesn't like him particularly either because he knows the truth too, the brother. So that's why he's looking so pensive. And this last uh, scene between uh, Mrs. Miller, between Cloris Leachman and Barry Brown, is the sort of the climax of the picture. It's very touching. 
and we we talked about it that she would not play it as though she thought that Daisy was going to die. I wish Ben away. Cloris and I talked about it, and we said, let's play it optimistic, like she's not really that sick. I'm sure she did. Well, she's very flighty, Mrs. Miller. She says she never was engaged to that Mr. And here, this is the sort of the climax of the picture when she tells him that she never was engaged. And so, in other words, on Daisy's deathbed, lady told me she thought he was afraid I didn't approve. Of she uh, she tells the mother something that she hopes she'll tell Winterborn. She spoke of you very kindly, and the camera moves in here because she made so much of it. Of course, that's the uh, the climax of the picture, right there. Do you remember the time we went to Shion? And those are actually the last words that Daisy um, is quoted as saying. And the death of Daisy is announced here through the door with um, the uh, operatic song going. Again, I didn't see any point in being too obvious, so we did it like this as a long shot because no actor could play it and put the sense of tragedy into it that we uh, would want to convey. So did it in long shot. Also, it's more subtle, I thought, than going to a big head. And the flower pattern on the door isn't coincidental either. This is the funeral scene. I got to the funeral scene, and uh, we all got, it was all ready to shoot. I got there and I said, I can't shoot this, and I went home, I wrapped the company. I don't know why, but I was overwhelmed. And this, uh, the amen you heard was my voice. It's the only time I make an appearance in this movie. I'm the minister who says amen, and right at the beginning. Mrs. Miller is a kind of flighty woman, and of course, you, all the more touching when you see a breakdown in the few moments. This is all one shot again, from the grave she was the most beautiful young to this moment when he finds out that she was the most innocent. The most innocent? He doesn't believe it, you see. He still doesn't get it. This was shot outside Rome, and uh, we found a place with trees that we liked and where we could get a final shot that would work for us. And uh, we planned, uh, Scarfiotti uh, had the gravestones design brought in. It was not a graveyard. We created this for the picture. All the graveyards in Rome are way overcrowded. We couldn't get an angle where it would look beautiful enough for the ending. And uh, all this is in one shot again. And then he, as he walks away, the camera pulls back. The scene continues, and uh, Mrs. Miller walks away with Eugenio and Rand, and uh, again, we don't go to a close-up. I thought it was more touching to see her break down. All this was played in one shot until the cut to the boy, who really, um, this wasn't in the, in the um, story, but uh, that curse from the boy look will haunt him. Maybe he'll finally figure out that uh, if only he'd announced himself, if only he'd realized that she was in love with him, he everything could have been different. The dialogue that we hear between Winterborn and his aunt actually comes at the end of the book, but we didn't want to have a scene, so we wanted to see him as he belongs there with the daisies on the ground and next to the grave, that's the way we wanted to see him. We had a fire going over where they were burning leaves. We put it in so that uh, we would have that effect, which uh, borrowed from Mr. Ford, who borrowed it from Mr. Griffith. I've lived too long in foreign parts, and that's sort of his reason. We fade to white because white is the color of innocence. And I thought it would be nice to bring Daisy back out of the white. Uh, for the curtain calls. I think from a 
career and commercial point of view, it was probably a mistake to make Daisy Miller. But from an artistic point of view, uh, I think it was um, valiant. And I'm very, very proud of it. And I'm glad we made it. Seeing it uh, today, 30 years later, I have to say it's uh, certainly one of my best pictures. <laughs> ¶¶ 